today. It's good to know that although we don't have our normal size attendance here, you know, in person, that through YouTube, through Facebook Live, um, even we have a group of people uh, meeting up in the mountains tonight at a church camp out. Um, it's good to know that people all over this community, all over the world are gathered together in worship in many different ways, praising God and in one voice, you know, lifting up, you know, their praise and honor and glory to him. So I'm excited about that. I know it's been a weird time. These last several months have been weird, and I'd hate having to keep emphasizing that because I just want to get up here and preach, but I know it's kind of weird. It's weird that everybody's like, am I supposed to shake your hand? And we do this awkward fist bump, shoulder rub kind of thing. Um, it, it's awkward to have to, you know, wear a mask and to sit apart. It, it's awkward to have to stay home at times and all of that, but I, I'm thankful that, that all of you as a, as a church family are, are bearing with us as we're just trying our best to try to make sense of everything, to do what we can to keep people connected and keep people worshiping God. We don't know 100% the right thing to do in every situation. And in, during this difficult time, there's been a lot of gray area. There's been a lot of, you know, not everything is, is easy and cut and dry. So I really do appreciate everybody's patience as we just try our best to do what we can to serve God here in Visalia and glorify him all over the world. This morning, though, and if I can get you to switch over to my slides, Nick, um, well, this morning what I want us to notice is in the Bible, when you look in the New Testament, you'll find that um, throughout the New Testament, you'll find that outsiders are the ones that come to Jesus often. And here's what I mean by that. When you look at starting in the early ministry of Jesus, the, the Messiah was supposed to be, at least in the Jewish mind, kind of this kingly figure. He was supposed to be one who was going to sit on the throne of David. He was supposed to be one that was going to maybe reign and kick out the Romans, and then Jesus came, and he didn't come like that. Jesus came very much of humble beginnings, born, a, you know, in a stable, laid in a manger and all of that. You know, that was an outside kind of perspective on things. And then you think about throughout the Bible, the people that came to following Jesus were not those that were the religious elite of the day. They were not those that everybody looked at as being holy. They were the people that were looked at as kind of on the fringe of society, just kind of quickly think about it. Jesus was born to a, a, a teen mom who, when she was found pregnant with Jesus, was unwed at the time. That's an outsider in that society. She would have been looked down upon in that society. In fact, Joseph was afraid and wanted to send her away secretly, right? You think about all the people that came to Jesus and followed him. They weren't the wealthy people. They weren't the rich people. They were poor people. Jesus is going along the Sea of Galilee, which was the northern part of Palestine. There wasn't the wealthy center of town and everything. He goes along the Sea of Galilee and calls fishermen. That's a rough background. In fact, from those people, you have his disciples being formed. One of the first people that Jesus revealed himself as being the Messiah to was a Samaritan woman. Now, if you're new to the Bible, that, that's a huge outsider right there. The Jewish people in the New Testament time wouldn't have anything to do with Samaritans. And yet, here Jesus reveals his Messiahship to her. And in fact, she's in an adulterous situation. She's poor. She's gathering water. And Jesus teaches her. Jesus calls tax collectors. Jesus, you know, reaches out to a woman who's caught in adultery. Jesus is around sinners. Jesus even has good interaction with Gentiles, which in the first century, if you're a Jewish person, you would not do that. Throughout the Bible, you see that Christianity is for the outsider. And we're not used to that a little bit, especially in, in, in our country. We're kind of used to that, you know, hey, going to church on Sunday is kind of the norm. I mean, maybe not everybody's as dedicated as other people to Jesus, but, but if you said, hey, what are you doing on Sunday? You say, well, I'm going to church in the morning. That wouldn't be weird, okay? That wouldn't make you an outsider. In fact, it's kind of almost a norm in our society where, hey, if you want to kind of interact, you claim faith in Jesus Christ. That's why even like politicians and things always kind of align themselves with a church in some way because they know that it's kind of expected, right? So the idea of being an outsider and being a Christian is not always what we're used to. But in the Bible, you find that those who were following Jesus were often on the fringe elements of society. They weren't those that were in political positions of power. They weren't those who were very influential. They weren't the wealthy. They weren't the elite. They weren't the influencers. It was just normal people or rejected people, hurting people, broken people who needed hope. And what I want us to do today is we're going to look at one of these individuals that would have been viewed as an outsider. And what's so neat about this situation 
is as I was studying through this passage, it really dawned on me that so often as we look at the Bible and we look at conversions in the Bible, we always identify different people as, well, this was the first convert in this area. This was the first Gentile convert. This was the first, you know, family and, and so on. Here in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, we have a conversion of the first man that we have recorded in Scripture is not being from Judea. In fact, he would have been an outsider. He would have been somebody who wasn't from any kind of religious background that they would have been used to. In fact, he's from the continent of Africa. Now, normally when we look at the Bible, we don't think, well, there's not African converts in Scripture. In Acts chapter 8, we have it very much laid out for us that one of the earliest followers of Christianity was a man not from Judea, not from Jerusalem, not from, you know, the area around Rome or anything like that, but he's from what would have been modern-day Sudan there in Africa. Let's look together. Acts chapter 8. Now, what we've been doing on Sunday morning is we've been going through the book of Acts, and we're going chapter by chapter, verse by verse through this book, and what we're looking at, and if you're new to Scripture, this is a story of how the early Christians you know, spread Christianity following the time of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus has already died on the cross. He resurrected from the grave, spent time with his disciples, ascended into heaven, and sent his followers, his disciples, and the people that they converted out into the world to spread Christianity. The book of Acts is about missions. It's about the church on the move. It's about how the church turned the world upside down. But what we're going to see today is as we look at this section in the book of Acts, we're also going to find this sub-thread in here of this fact that Jesus is Lord of all. And that's the point I want us to see today. Because I know that many of you are familiar with this conversion story. But what we need to remind ourselves of is that Jesus wants to be and is Lord of all. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what country, what continent, or any baggage in your past. Jesus is Lord of all, and we all need to come to him, you know, in that same way. So with that in mind, then let's look, Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. And I hope you brought a Bible. If you didn't, pull one up on your phone, because we're going to kind of be going verse by verse through here, and I want you to be able to follow along. So we just had Philip, who's an evangelist. He's out there preaching. He had this whole interaction that took place with Simon the sorcerer in chapter 8 in the first part. And now we have, in verse 26, it says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up. And go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. So Philip is petitioned by this angel to go out and preach in another area. So he's heading toward this desert road that, you know, that extends toward Gaza. So he gets up and he goes. God called him to preach. He goes and preaches. So as he's going, there was a man, it says an Ethiopian eunuch, who was a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, this Ethiopian man, let's break this down a little bit. First off, when they, although they're using the term Ethiopian, from everything that I've seen in my study, that was what the Jewish people referred to Africans as, as Ethiopians. You know, we didn't have the understanding back then of all the different continents and label them the same way that we do. So when they referred to Ethiopians, that was what they called black people. They were Ethiopians. Now, the fact that he is you know, a servant of Candace the queen. Well, Candace was actually a royal family name of the royal family of the area, which would be modern-day Sudan. So you have Egypt, and then below that you have this region where this man would be from. So it's south of the Egyptian empire. Now you have the empire here of Candace, who's called the queen of the Ethiopians. So you have this man. We're not given his name. There's a name given in history of him, and I don't recall what that was. But here you have this man who works for the queen, and he is traveling back from Jerusalem to worship. Now, that might not stand out to you at first, but think about this. A man from Africa going to Jerusalem, which is the hub of Judaism, of the Jewish faith, going to worship is already something odd. That would make him an outsider. He didn't fit in there. He wasn't part of the Jewish people but yet he had enough understanding of the God of the Bible that he wanted to worship him. He knew that the temple was there in Jerusalem. That was the center of worship of this God. So he traveled there to worship. This man was very much an outsider. And if you think about it, there's many different ways he was an outsider. First off, back home, 
Think about this. He would have been an outsider in his own country. He wouldn't have fitted in there because he's, first off, he works for the queen. And by the way, the fact that he's called a eunuch, that means he was castrated. And that's what allowed him to work with her. They didn't want him to be struggling with any kind of temptations for the queen. They wanted to make sure that he could, you know, take care of her different affairs. And they wanted to make sure there was no scenes or sense of impropriety going on. So that's what they did. And historically, that was a practice that took place in many different royal circles. So he's already an outsider in his country for that. Because not everybody walks around that way. Okay? Number two, he's also a worshiper of a foreign god. So there in Ethiopia, to be worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would make him different already. So he didn't fit in at home. And he's also a reader of what would have been considered foreign religious texts. As you read in the book of Acts, he's reading from the book of Isaiah. I guarantee it, your average person in the Sudan wasn't reading from Isaiah. They had their own gods they worshiped. But yet he's following the God of the Bible. So then he goes to Israel to worship. Think about him there. He would have been an outsider too. He's not a Jew by birth. Now, he most likely was a proselyte, which meant he converted to Judaism, but he still wouldn't fit in. He's a black man in a Jewish world trying to worship what would have been considered the Jewish God. And because he was a eunuch, he would not have been allowed to even enter into the temple for formal worship because of his, his mutilation. So think about that. Here you have a man who didn't fit in at home, traveling to Jerusalem to worship the God that he knows is the true God. And when he goes there to worship, he's not even able to kind of go into the church building, okay? He'd have to wait outside. Do you think he felt like an outsider? Absolutely. And he also was a foreigner. So that's this man that Philip is about to talk to about Jesus. So let's keep reading. Acts chapter 8, and in verse 28, it says, And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. So this man obviously does have means. He works for the queen. So someone's probably driving the chariot and he's there sitting reading from the Isaiah scroll, which would have been expensive to have too. So this man took money that he had, used it to buy scripture and was studying it. So he's reading along, basically reading his Bible. And Philip comes up and, or the spirit says to Philip, go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? So Philip runs up to the chariot, sees him, and says, hey, by the way, do you understand what you're reading right there? Great segue into evangelism, right? Run to the person studying their Bible and ask them if they need any help. So that's what he does. He runs up to him, and he says, well, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So he says, I really don't get this. Can you help me out? So he asks Philip to come get in the chariot with him. So Philip gets in the chariot with the man from Ethiopia, and they open up the scroll, and they begin to have a Bible study. And we find out that this man is actually reading from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, in verse 7. And this passage was very confusing to this man. A neat fact, if you look back a couple chapters, there's actually stuff about eunuchs in the book of Isaiah. Maybe he was reading through that and came to this section. But in verse um, 32, it says, now, the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment is taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. Now, the eunuch says, I don't understand what this means. We look at that. We go, yeah, that's kind of confusing. I don't understand what that means. So what happens is um, Philip or starts to talk with him, and the eunuch asks Philip and says, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? And the text says that Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Because that's actually a prophecy about Jesus. So Philip has a Bible study with him. And Philip teaches this man from Africa, who's traveled back home now from Jerusalem to worship and he's teaching him about Jesus. We don't know what all went on in this conversation. We don't know the extent of how long this Bible study was. We don't know the back and forth. We don't know the questions. We don't know any of those things. But somewhere along the way, they talked about salvation, I'm sure. They talked about sin. They talked about the need to follow Jesus because this Ethiopian man wasn't familiar with Jesus yet. He was going to Jerusalem to worship. He still kind of dialed into the old way of doing things, Old Testament worship. And yet now he's learning about the Messiah. 
He's learning about the Son of God. He's learning about Jesus. And we find out that in verse 36, he asks Philip another question. It says, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, on the screen right there, that's actually an image from the Rephaim Valley. That probably would have been the route that he would have been taking back home from Jerusalem. There's actually a, a site there where they claim is the location of this baptism. But some of those things you don't always know for sure if that's true. Because people also want to make money off of religious places. And they always build you know, gift shops and churches there. But um, there, we do know that this is where that ancient road would have been. And there was sources of water along the way. So they're traveling home. Or the eunuch is with Philip there studying with him. And somehow in the conversation, they obviously talked about baptism because you don't get baptism from Isaiah 53. So Philip has been teaching him and all of that. And we know that Philip has already been teaching people about Jesus previously in this chapter. They were teaching about Jesus and baptizing and all of that. And we find out that this man heard and learned enough that he asked this question. Hey, here's water. What keeps me from being baptized? Now, there's a... A uh, passage here comes up next in the next verse, in verse 37. Uh, we'll talk about, you know, some of, I know your Bible might have it bracketed, but historical tradition says that the eunuch, or that Philip answered this way, if you believe with all your heart, you may, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then look what happens next. It says he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So this man, who would have been considered an outsider in all different circles, this man who would have been rejected in Jerusalem where he went to worship, a man who probably wouldn't fit in back home, a man who on his own is trying to seek out the God that he's reading about in Scripture, has a man that comes to him and teaches him about the Son of God, and he makes a decision to follow him. And they go down in the water, both Philip and the eunuch are there, and Philip baptizes him. This man who felt like an outsider probably most of his life is now in Christ Jesus. He's now connected to something bigger than himself. He's part of the family of God. And we find out that he goes on his way rejoicing. Verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Philip leaves and the eunuch no longer saw him but went on his way rejoicing. I imagine he had a fun chariot ride back to you know, the Sudan, right? I mean, the whole way on fire thinking, I'm saved, right? And he's leaving rejoicing. And then we find out that Philip is now in Caesarea preaching. But what do we see from this passage? We see that it doesn't matter the background. Jesus is Lord of all. Here you have Philip teaching the man from Ethiopia about the God who many of them viewed as the Jewish God, which we know he's not. But Jesus is Lord of all. Doesn't matter the background. They all come to him the same way. But what stands out to me today is the fact that an outsider was one of the first people to be in Christ. Normally we look at the man Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 as the first Gentile conversion, and I know because this man was practicing Judaism, he's not really referred to as a Gentile, but he wasn't Jewish by birth. He would have been considered an outsider. And this outsider was one of the first to be in Christ. And not just an outsider in a local community, but from another continent was the first, one of the first to follow Jesus. So for us then, an application that we can make is that although at times we might feel like we don't fit in, we don't fit in maybe in our families, we don't fit in in our cities, we don't fit in in our country, in the world, in society, we don't have to feel like an outsider in Jesus. Jesus has a place for all of us. Everyone, doesn't matter the background, can have a new beginning in Jesus Christ, just like this Ethiopian man did. I love the fact that the text says it was, that he went on his way rejoicing. His life was changed from that moment forward. Now, I did a bunch of digging. I was trying to find out, hey, what happened to the Ethiopian eunuch? What did he do when he get back home? And there's different theories and traditions and things. Um, the first really big movement of Christianity in that region is really not till like the 4th century. We don't know what happened with him. But I do know that he was saved. And I do know that his life was changed. So much so that even after Philip disappears, he's not even caught off guard by that. He just goes on home rejoicing. And I imagine he was skipping alongside the chariot. That's what I see in my mind. Not riding it anymore because of how happy and excited he is. 
He rejoiced because his sins were taken away. He rejoiced because he was saved. This outsider was now in Christ Jesus. So the question then for us is how will we respond? When the opportunity for salvation arises, will we respond in the same way that the Ethiopian man did? Hopefully we will. When the opportunity for evangelism happens, will we respond like Philip? He ran to the chariot. I love that scene. He doesn't walk there. He runs to it. When the opportunity to teach someone about Jesus comes up, we take that opportunity. Will we be like, you know, the attitude of the eunuch, a dedication to God's word enough to study on his own, and when we learn, we make changes in our life? Hopefully, we will respond like he did. You know, I've told this before, that in the back of my Bible, I've written down the name of every person I've ever baptized. And I, I don't show that off, that's just for me, because I want to go back and look over it, remember those memories, maybe pray for those people, and those kinds of things. As I look through that list, in, in the back of my Bible, I, I see names representing all different walks of life. You know, there's people there that, that all different, you know, ethnic backgrounds, white people, black people, people from this city, people from other cities, people from other states, people that are old, people that are young, people, you know, that are able-bodied, people that are disabled, many, di many different backgrounds. But when I look at, at this list in my Bible of all these different names, I think about the fact that all of them at one moment responded in the same way. And after their baptism, you know what they all did? They went on their way rejoicing. Now, not everyone is still faithful to Jesus Christ. I know that, and that, that makes me sad. Not everyone is maybe as on fire as they once were. All of us have ups and downs. Some of these people have passed away and gone on to their eternal reward, which does give me hope. But when I look at these names in the back of my Bible, I'm reminded that all these people at one time probably felt like an outsider because of sin, because of something in their life, but they came to Jesus, they were baptized, just like this Ethiopian man was, and they too went on their way rejoicing. So this morning, my application for all of us is let's respond like he did. Now, we're not going to have a, our traditional invitation song and ask people to come forward or anything like that, but let me encourage you that if you've never done what he did here, talk to somebody. If you want to learn more about Jesus so that you can do what he did here, we'll talk to you about Jesus. We love sharing Jesus with people. If you want to learn more or if you've strayed away and if you feel like right now you haven't been rejoicing like you should, let us give you a reason to have joy. In just a moment, Brother Steve is going to come back up to the mic and lead us in a song. Let me encourage you right now, though, as he comes to the mic, let's all stand together and sing the song that was selected. Brother Steve.